All right, on to the Lab 8 problems and solutions. So we've got two questions here. I've set up my R Markdown document. Um, R, base R doesn't have uh, Z test functions and things like that. So the purpose of this uh, problems are to write some functions for various parts of uh, these issues. So the first one is write a function to convert a vector of raw scores into Z scores. And the function should have inputs for the vector the mean and standard deviation of the normal, and should return a vector of z-scores. Also demonstrate the function works correctly. Um, so let's do that. Oops, here we go. And let's see. I'm going to name two z-scores. Yeah, that's a fine name for a function. How about that? So I'll have my raw scores, and then I'm going to have the mean, and I'm going to have the standard deviation as inputs. And basically, I mean, this is a pretty simple function. So I can take my uh, raw scores minus the mean. Um, Let's do mean minus the raw scores. Um, no, sorry, <laughs> raw scores minus the mean. Divide by the standard deviation. And that's basically all you'd really need to do here. But I'm going to do this slightly differently. And here we go. Let's try that. Need to get rid of that parentheses. So there we've got a function. I'm just gonna try it out. Let's make some numbers. And what should these numbers be? Well, they could be the numbers one, two, three, four, five. And if I wanted to turn these into z-scores, then I would be doing this for the raw, some numbers, and then some mean. I could say it's a mean of five and a standard deviation of one. Now, does this look right? Let's see, for the first value, that is uh, four away from the mean. That's right, so it should be minus four, and we're divided by one, so we'll get a minus four. 2 is 3 away from the mean. Yep, looks like we're working just fine here. There's a few uh, advanced aspects. So have an option so that the function will convert the raw scores to z-scores in one of two possible ways. That is, having the user provide the mean and standard deviation. That's how we've got the function working right now. And having the, it's about, you could do it a different way. You could calculate the mean and standard deviation from the raw scores and use those. So I'll just try something like that. I'm just gonna call this B as a different function. There's more than one way we can do what I'm about to do here, but I'm gonna do this for, for now. So I'm gonna set as a default, mu as null and sd as null. And what I'm going to do first is say, if is.null mu equals true, so that is, what this means is, if people, if the user doesn't provide a value for mu, then it will be null, right? Because by default, it will be null. That's what I'm declaring right here. So if that's the case, then what I want to do is replace mu with a calculated mean 
from the raw data. I'm going to do the same thing for the standard deviation. So if, if the user doesn't provide a standard deviation value, um, oh, I'm gonna, I don't want the SD to conflict with the internal uh, oops, the internal function for standard deviation. So it'd be something like this. Finally, we can compute our z-scores, and we could say we need to take raw minus mu and divide by the s-dev, and then we can return those. So let's see if this works. For example, two z-scores b if we put in some numbers again, we should get what we got before. Whoops, to z scores. Oh, there's no function. Um, oh, I didn't name this to z scores. Ah, jeez. And I've got so many mistakes here. Z scores is spelt wrong. All right. Okay, so before what I did was I assigned a value of five for mu and a value of one for the S dev, and we got those numbers. But if I do not supply those values, then what happens is we calculate the mean of these values and the standard deviation of these values and use the sample mean and standard deviation to convert to z-scores. And you know that, that's questionable behavior really when it comes to z-scores because you should know what the mean and standard deviation is from some normal distribution in order to do this. Anyways, those are two examples of solving problem number one. All right, so problem number two is that base R doesn't have a z-test function. So we're gonna write a function to do a one sample z-test. And that is the test where we compare the probability of obtaining a sample mean uh, to some known normal distribution. Um, I didn't say that quite right. Probability of obtaining a sample mean, or larger or smaller, if it came from some known normal distribution. So we're getting two points to write the function, and then we're asking to use the z-test function to conduct a test of the following situation. All right, let's make the function. So I'm thinking about what we need to have, and let's call it z.test. That'd be a good name for a function. We need a sample mean. We need to know what that is. And we need a sample size. And we also need to know what the mean of the normal distribution is, where the numbers came from. And we need to know what the standard deviation is. I guess we could use the word sigma here. That would make more, that would be more consistent with our previous language in the lab. So our function needs all of this information. And next, um, so let, let me say that we need to calculate, uh, we need to know what the mean and the standard deviation are for the sampling distribution of the mean that is relevant to the situation. 
So I want to talk about the sampling distribution mean. Uh, I'm just going to be very explicit about and kind of long about doing this. And that is going to be the value mu, right? Because we expect the mean of our sample on average to be the mean of the population. So we're going to set that as mu. Well, the sampling distribution also has a standard deviation. And in this case, that is formally defined as the standard error of the mean. And the standard error of the mean is the sigma of the parent distribution divided by the square root of n. And so here, our n is defined by our sample size. So in our function, I'm computing the mean of the sampling distribution and the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. And these are two parameters we need um, because according to the central limit theorem, this sampling distribution is a normal distribution. Therefore, we can use the normal distribution um, and calculate the probability of getting a particular sample mean uh, from a normal distribution. So we're basically calculating the probability of getting sample mean from a normal distribution with this mean and this standard deviation. And we are, okay, so this function gets a little, can become a little bit complicated here. Um, in the, just in that uh, to control whether we want to do a, an upper tail or lower tail or a one tail or a two tail. So I guess I'm going to keep things kind of simple right now just because I what I like to do is make functions that I think should work and then test out to see if they do work. So I'm calculating the p-value here. So let's try this out. Um, we can try it out on this example here. So we've got a sample of 25 scores and the mean of the sample is 50. So the sample mean equals 50. The sample size equals 25. And all this stuff came from a normal distribution with a mean of 40. So mu is 40. And a standard deviation of 7. So sigma equals 7. All right, we're being asked to report a one-tailed z-test examining the probability of obtaining a sample of 50 or greater in this situation. And I'm actually gonna reword this. It'll be a sample of greater than 50 because that's what this will return. And Oh, we didn't have the function return anything, so have it return the p-value. And we're getting a probability of 1 here. I don't know. This doesn't seem right. So we want to set the lower tail to be false, I think. And we get a really tiny p-value. All right, so basically what we're figuring out here is that if you got a sample mean of 50 um, and uh, your sample size was 25 
it, you know, something like that would be very unusual if your normal distribution had a mean of 40 and a standard deviation of 7. Yeah, so highly unlikely, very, very small p-value. Um, I'm just going to mess around with this just for a little bit just to see if it is behaving like it probably should. So imagine you got a sample mean of 1 and your sample size was 1 and it came from a distribution with a mean of 0, a sigma of 1. Now this is the unit normal distribution. This would be getting one score um, with a standard deviation of one away from the mean. We're asking how often, or what's the probability of getting a score larger than that? And we're getting back 0.158. And yeah, we know that half of the time, so a probability of 0.5, you're going to get a value less than zero, right? If the distribution is centered on zero, it's going to be half the time you get a value less than zero. And if we remember from the lab, there's a 0.34 probability, 0.341, something like that, of getting a value between the mean and one standard deviation. So I'm just going to put that here. I'm just going to add those two numbers together, 0.841. All right, so you have a 0.841 probability of getting a number that is less than one, right, from this distribution. So the other side of that so 1 minus 0 0.841, that's the complement, is 0.159. So are these the same? Yep, I'm just doing a little check to, to see that my z-test function is giving me back results that make sense. All right. Um, we've, we could extend this just a little bit. I'll just do that. For example, we're only doing what's known as one-tailed tests, um, testing if a value is larger than a, sorry, we're asking about the probability that you could get a score or larger than that score from the distribution. And the way we wrote our function we can't do two-tailed tests. We could add that very quickly. Uh, we could say uh, tails and have, have people supply a number one or two for one or two-tailed. Um, we could have a two-tailed equals false. This could be a default. So by default, you'll do a one-tail test. Or by default, yeah. I, I mean, I think actually the def most people's default is to do a two-tailed test. So we could set it to be true. That would be the default test will be two-tailed. Um, so for example, if two-tailed equals true, what we're going to do is take the p-value and multiply it by 2. Because uh, this distribution is symmetrical, and the probability of getting a value as extreme as the sample mean in either direction is just the same probability we already calculated on both sides of the different distribution. So we're just going to take that and times it by 2. And, you know, if, if this is false, then we'll just basically, we won't do this, <laughs> and we'll just return the single one-sided p-value. Uh, so if we use this new function now, 
the default is two tailed equals true. And we can just write that here to be complete. Uh, slightly smaller probability becomes slightly, or sorry, the probability is slightly increased. Um, this function also won't handle the other side of the question, really. So if we had a sample mean of, let's say, if we have a sample mean of 41, this is this will work. We're going to get a probability of 0.47 two-tailed. Let's put it up to 43. Oh, okay. So now we're getting a 0 0.03. So even even getting a a 43 is pretty unlikely with a sample size of 25. You know, if our sample size was only 20, or let's say our sample size was only five, we can see here that the probability increases. Um, so there's more variability when our sample sizes are small, and our sample mean in this situation could easily be 43 by chance. So that 43 or larger. Um, if we did something like 37, uh, we get a strange answer, and that's because we've got two-tailed. We haven't really dealt with numbers that are smaller than the mean in our function, because um, we're, what we're looking at is like basically the upper, ta the entire upper tail of the distribution. Uh, so when we ask this question, what's the chance of getting 37 or higher here in a one-tailed test, that's 83% that's, uh, or 83, 0.83 probability. Um, whereas, you know, this is a deviation of three. So we could rewrite the function, I guess, to handle numbers that are on the other side here. And what would that look like? Well, let's just take all of this and write it again. And this is starting to get long. So our inputs, I'm just going to try to make them more clear like this. Uh, I don't know. How about direction? And let's have it set up so that the direction could be, uh, well, let's make it different. How about this? We'll have an input called larger than equals true. So by default, we're going to be asking the question, what's, or returning the answer to the question, what's the probability that the sample mean uh, sorry, what's the probability you could get a sample mean or larger than that? And that will be the default thing that we return. And that's what our function is currently doing. So we could say if larger than equals true, then what we're going to do is all these things that we just did. I'm going to tab this out. And then the uh, we write else, and we can do a different function. Or it, we can handle the other side of this. So for example, if uh, someone put false here, what we intend to ask is, um, what's the probability you could get a sample mean or smaller than that, or get a value smaller than the sample mean that you found. All right. And so, we're gonna have to modify some of this stuff here. 
And we're actually going to be doing something that's a little detailed. Let me point out that we're using the pnorm function. And I've been fumbling a bit when I'm speaking, talking about whether we're asking the question one, what is the probability, probability of observing a value larger than the sample mean? We could also ask, what is the probability of getting the sample mean or larger? We're basically talking about whether we include the sample mean or not. In the p-norm function, the lower tail can be set to true or false. And, to, and this, when it's set to true, we're looking at the probability, uh, which is the default, the probability of getting the score uh, less than or equal to the probability of getting scores less than or equal to a particular score. However, if you set lower tail to false, we're looking at the upper side. And here, the logical operator is slightly different. Here, we're asking the probability of getting a value larger than the number, not larger than or equal to. So, this is going to give us slightly different results. Um, and since, uh, seeing as up here, we set lower tail equals false. Let's be consistent down here. We're going to keep this as lower tail dot false, but you're going to see this is going to make us do some backflips. So first of all, our uh, parameters for the distribution are going to be the same. We don't have to worry about that. But our sample mean now is going to be a value that's going to be lower than this value. So imagine this is going to be, I mean, in, in let's say we have a, a mu of 10 and a sample mean of 9. Um, and we've set lower tail to false. Uh, yeah. Let me think. All right, I did a bunch of thinking. And what I'm going to do is totally scrap this approach. Instead, I'm going to do it slightly differently. Take out all this stuff. Take out that. Go back here. Take that out. So we're basically at where we were before. We don't need this larger than stuff. And instead, I'm just going to recognize that um, we could be thinking about the absolute deviation from the mean here. So rather than using the sample mean directly, like let's say, let's say we have a X score or a, a sample mean of 10 and a mu of 20, or we had a sample mean of 30. Now both of these deviate from mu by 10 and one's in a positive direction, one's in the other direction. Um, and seeing as the normal distribution is symmetrical, we're really just interested in the probability for a one-tail test that you could deviate more than 10 in one direction. Um, for a two-tail test, we're interested in if you could deviate by 10 in either direction. So it's really just about this, this 10, and it's not really about the 30 or the 10. This is about the difference between those numbers and the mean. So I'm going to create a variable called absolute difference. And we could take uh, our sample mean, 
and minus the mean, sorry, minus mu, and take the absolute value of that. That's going to be a positive value. Right? And then when we put that in here, our ABS difference, uh, this will return a one-tailed p-value, and this will return the two-tailed p-value. And does that look like it's working? Maybe not. Do I have to think about this some more? Let's see. Oh yes, I did something that was not going to work. Um, I need to be a little bit more specific here. That in p-norm, we're repl instead of putting sample mean in there, we're putting the deviation from the population mean, which is mu, in a positive direction using the absolute difference value to get our p-value, um, which will represent the one-tailed test for our deviation in one direction in uh, either the positive or the negative direction. And then we can multiply it by 2 to get the two-sided p-value. And this, I think, looks like it will work better. All right, that was more time than I planned to spend here, but that gets you uh, three different ways to do a kind of one sample z-test in R. And that's all for this week.